glad to glad to see everybody here this morning. I uh, appreciate your uh, attendance and appreciate you being in prayers for Jack and the family as they are away, taking a little bit of vacation time. I wanted to uh, go over just to hit the announcements real quickly. Um, of course, the, the big thing is there's something going on this evening, right, Miss Meredith? We got, a, we got a mess, VBS. And um, so this evening, kicking it off at 515 with a hot dog, uh, hot dog dinner. So you don't want to miss that. And uh, come join us at 515. And then uh, that'll be at the picnic shelter, it says. I'm looking at DR. He's giving me a thumbs up, thumbs up there. And then uh, VBS through the rest of the, rest of the week uh, through Wednesday, Monday through Wednesday, 6 to 8. And then I know there was another little blurb here. Sign up for the beginning today from 6 to 8. Registration forms are here on the communion table, or you can see Meredith. And I uh, hope to see everybody here this evening at 515. There are some other announcements there. I'll direct you to the middle section of the bulletin. Uh, the men will be having the uh, uh, prayer breakfast on Tuesday morning at PB Clark's. So that starts at 6. Uh, and then, of course, BBS Monday through Wednesday. And um, I think that's everything that's kind of big in here. Um, there's also an announcement on the back of the bulletin regarding the nominating committee. The nominating committee is kicking off again. And... Um, you can see that information there. They're looking for uh, uh, folks to contact the uh, nominating committee uh, Sunday, August 16th. Sunday, August 16th. So um, we'll probably hear more from those folks uh, in the days to come. Are there any other announcements that I might have missed? Looking around the room. And back here. Nope. Parker, nothing. Okay. Well, let's start off with a word of prayer. Gracious Father, I thank you that we are here this morning to worship and to praise you. I thank you that you've called us here together as a corporate body, Father, to lift you up in praise and in worship, Father, and that in those moments as we quiet our hearts, you desire to commune with us, to talk to us, to teach us, and to guide us. Father, give us ears to hear. Give us hearts to obey. And then, Father, afterwards, give us feet and hands that move in obedience to you. I'm so grateful that you brought us here this morning, and we ask all of these things in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Our call to worship today is from uh, Isaiah chapter 25. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness, you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. Would y'all please stand with us as we sing, Blessed Be Your Name. <coughs> Streams of abundance 
the land. And all who've gone before us, and all who will believe, will sing the song of ages to the land. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. this morning is there on the uh, center portion of your bulletin. Pretty sure it's going to be up on the screen in just a moment. It's from Matthew 25, 
verse 19 and 21. I think there's a typo, I think there's a typo there in the bulletin. 19, because I don't think there's 218 verses in the 25th chapter. So 19 through 21. And this is just a portion of what we're going to be talking about this morning, just a little segment of what we're going to talk about. But listen um, as I read that to you. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Father, thank you for allowing us to be here this morning and to um, just to gather and to pause to hear from your word. I pray for your words, not mine. I pray for um, your heart, that it would envelop mine. Take the words that have been prepared, Lord, and just use them according to your will and to your plan. Father, I know there's also many needs in our congregation this morning. I, I lift up um, Shirley Samuels as she's uh, recovering from surgery last evening. And Lord, uh, I, I'm sure there are others. Uh, we want to continue to remember, remember John Haynes and Jeanette Robertson, Father, and... and um, and also, we just continue to lift up Jack and Jerry and Landon as they're all away, having some vacation time, some refreshment, uh, restoration. Uh, just bless that time for them. Lord, I know there are many other concerns, and I'm thankful that you know them even when I don't. And you're working in them in every moment. We give you praise, and we thank you for these moments. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I read you use loaves and bread Raise the dead and what you said So I know it's what you do I've seen you use men like me to free the slaves and part the seas. So I know it's what you do. You make weak things strong and you give bones their flesh. So I believe you can use me. You make poor men weak. And you give dead men breath So I believe You can use me When tragedy's all I see Drowning in anxiety I'll trust it's in your hands A pain so real it moves my feet A soul that sings a melody I'll trust it's in your hands You make weak things strong And give bones their flesh So I believe You can use me You make poor men rich And give dead men breath So I believe You can use me just like Moses, just like Peter, just like David and Elijah, just like my mama and my father, if you can use them, you can use me, and just like my pastor or Sunday school teacher, or front door greeter or student leader just like the missionary 
or the one who cleans the sanctuary. If you can use them, you can use me. You make weak things strong and give bones their flesh. So I believe you can use me. You make poor men rich and give dead men breath. So I believe you can use me. Oh, I believe you can use me. Oh, I believe you can use me. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, labor statistics, there are three factors that will determine how much an American will earn in a lifetime. Education, industry, and income growth. Education would say that people with a high school diploma earn about $1.3 million over their lifetime, while those with a bachelor's degree earn about $2.3 million with advanced degrees, professional or doctoral, can expect to earn $3.6 million in a lifetime. Depending on which industry you work in, your salary, depending on which industry you work in, your income can vary significantly. And some workers may say, see a 50% increase in salary as their career progresses. Income growth, though, also factors into lifetime earnings. And a person whose income starts with around 75000 could, uh, with 3% annual raises, could earn more than $2 million over their career. By the way, that's a picture of uh, $2 million in movie prop money. Not real. Movie prop money. Sorry. It's not, it's not in my uh, living room either. Uh, another source states that the average American earns approximately $1.3 million over the lifetime based on working 20 years. So 20 years, 20 years of work is worth about $1.3 million. Fantastic. Awesome. Great. I should retire, right? Eh, then again, I did not say you would have $1.3 million. I said the average American could earn $1.3 million. So, uh, of course, you also need to deduct your bills and your home and your auto and your clothes and your vacations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then, all those things that you pay on an annual basis, but let's not forget everyone's favorite takeaway, taxes. Oh, yes. There's a Grinch, and his name is the Internal Revenue Service. I custom made that slide just for this moment. So let's just say then that after the Grinch takes most of our money, we still end up with $1.3 million, right? 1.3 million. Remember that number? I've said it, I think, four or five times. What would you do with it? Would you buy something nice? Hmm. Would you invest it? Would you pay off all your credit card debt? Pay off your home, your car, your boat, whatever? Or maybe you would dig a hole and put your $1.3 million in a hole and cover it up. You know, you, you remember Gandalf and Frodo in The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, and he found the ring and Gandalf says, keep it secret, keep it safe. Well, that's one way to keep your money safe. Dig a hole. So... We start off this morning hearing the parable of the talents. And I want you to understand that many times as we talk about this parable that we, we mix up the word talent as it's referred to here as currency or money. We mix that with our modern English word for talent meaning gifts. Okay, But Jesus was talking about a wealthy master giving three of his servants large amounts of cash to invest. How large? In the Roman world, a talent was a unit of currency that was worth about 20 years' wages. 
or in today's dollars, $1.3 million. So when you do the math, the first servant, he received $6.5 million, if you did according to today's uh, today's standards. The second servant, he received $2.6 million, and the third servant received $1.3 million in cash to invest. I tell you all that because I want you to understand how generous the master was being and the opportunity that he was giving each servant. But the talents also represent more than just financial resources from God. This story is about being given something which must be used well and the consequences of neglecting or abusing it. The talents represent what God has given us. Yes, our monetary resources and our callings to positions within the church and our national gifting, our natural giftings and uh, just a uh, word of thanks for that providential song that Meredith and Tyler sang. It's, it fits perfectly right here. The things that we do for the Lord. Each of these things and many others are given by God to use in ways that glorify Him and draw others toward Him. And, you know, Jesus never told a story that was as simple as it seemed. In fact, when Jesus told a parable, there was always something more. And this parable was joined with three other stories. The first story is about a servant who was abusing his position while the master is away. And this is from the previous chapter, Matthew 24, verses 45 through 51. He says, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in the household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. And at an hour he is not aware of, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So that was the first story. And then Jesus rolls right into the second story. And he, he tells about a wedding in Matthew 25, 1 through 13. So I'm going to paraphrase it for you this time. On the wedding day, the bridegroom went to the bride's house for the ceremony. Then the bride and the groom, along with a great procession, returned to the groom's house where a feast took place, usually lasting for a week. These 10 bridesmaids were waiting to join the procession. And they hoped to take part in the marriage feast. But when the groom didn't come at the expected time, five of them ran out of lamp oil. By the time they had purchased extra oil, it was too late to join the feast. Now listen, when Jesus returns to take his people to heaven, we have to be ready. That's the point. Spiritual preparation, you can't buy it at the last minute. You can't borrow it at the last minute. So we have the story about the servant who abuses the position. Then we have the parable of the 10 bridesmaids. Then we have the parable of the talents. And we're going to get there in just a moment. But wait, there's more. Because after Jesus tells these three stories, he tells a fourth story. A parable about sheep and goats. That parable paints a picture of the division between believers and unbelievers. Sheep and goats would graze together, but they were separated when it came time to shear the sheep. God is going to separate his obedient followers from pretenders and unbelievers. The real evidence of our belief is how we act. Do we treat everyone as if they were Jesus? Do we feed the hungry? Give the homeless a place to stay? Do we look after the sick? Are our actions any different from pretenders and unbelievers? So all four of these stories 
these parables are about followers of Jesus Christ being given something which must be used well. And the consequences of neglecting or abusing it. No parable by itself completely describes our preparation. Instead, each one of them paints a part of the whole picture. And the parable of the talents has something to say to us about how we need to take our talents and get out of that hole. Hang on, that was just the introduction. Okay, so let's get back to that parable of the talents and and let's dig a little deeper. It says in verse 14, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another, two bags, and to another, one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. Jesus Christ is that man going on the journey. After Christ was resurrected, he stayed with his disciples for 40 days and then ascended to heaven, promising to return later. We read about that in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, in my former book, Theophilus, Luke writes us, I, write, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And then continuing in verse 9, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So the servants in the parable are... Christ's disciples, or followers of Christ. We read in John 6, 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. So the first thing I want you to know today is that our talents come from God. Our talents come come from God. So as I said earlier, this parable is not solely about our skills, strengths, and abilities. Not solely about money, but about our skills, strengths, and abilities. Some of these abilities we are born with. Others are learned and developed over time. But all talents are given by God to glorify Him. There is no sacred versus secular work, though we do have official positions like the preaching and evangelizing and teaching, and I'll throw music and youth in there too. And Christians should not be molded by worldly standards. Romans 12.2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So we know that all creation was made very good because, well, in Genesis 1.31, Moses wrote, God saw all that He had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. And we know that we do all things to God's glory. Because Paul wrote to the Corinthians in his first letter, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whatever we are doing, as long as, not, as, long as it's not a sinful activity, whatever we are doing, we serve God well. By doing it well. 
Okay, so one more thing about talents from God. You know, we don't really own our gifts. We're fearfully and wonderfully made by God according to his plans laid out before we were born to glorify him forever. We read that in Psalm 139. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And Jeremiah wrote something similar. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. The master owns the money that he gave to the servants. He gets the results of the investments. That highlights who is in control. We, we naturally want to think that we can use our gifts as we please. And let's face it, in our culture where I am number one, we tend to think that we can live as we please. That's what I call digging a hole and jumping in it. Because it's all about me, me, me. I'm not sharing the gifts that God has given me, but instead serving myself, trying to be a little God of my life, Listen, folks, we have to get out of that hole because when we serve God with our gifts, then we find our true joy and place in life. So the second thing I want you to know today is that when much is given, much is required. So let's go back to our scripture, verse 16 in Matthew 25, the man who had received the five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Two of the servants from our parable went right to work. Why? Because they knew that the master expected a greater gain than what they had been given. In the same way, if God has given you more abilities, then he is expecting more from you. You see, Jesus said it this way from Luke 12. Verse 48, but the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Now that does not mean that if you've been given less that God expects nothing. The first two servants... Well, they produce the same percentage increase even though they had different amounts. God expects all of us to grow and to use what we've been given as much as we can. If you've been given strength and energy, use it energetically to serve others. If you've been given certain technical skills, use them to serve God. If you've been given financial means, put them to use helping others. If you've been given understanding, work to learn, and then share it with others with humility. The third servant, on the other hand, he dug a hole. He put his treasure in it, and he covered it up. He buried his treasure. He was afraid of the master, and he was lazy, so he did nothing with his treasure. See, what that third servant saw was a cruel taskmaster. He didn't take any joy in the promise of the master's return. 
He wasted his time. He wasted his opportunities. And he wasted his master's money. He somehow missed seeing that the master was generous and gracious. As we've looked at the first few verses of the parable of the talents, I want you to know that our talents come from God. Secondly, when much is given, much is required. And thirdly, I want you to know that our great expectation is to work and grow. So continuing on in Matthew, verses 19 through 23, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The same with the man with the two bags of gold also came. He said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. Again, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. We see from the passage that those who are faithful and responsible in using what they've been given will be rewarded. There's this false idea out there that Jesus' death on the cross is all that anyone needs to do to be a Christian. But in this parable, Jesus is telling us that Christians are expected to work and to be productive. Listen to what James wrote. Chapter 2, verses 17 through 26. In that same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. We're also supposed to produce and grow spiritual fruit. Paul describes it this way in Galatians 5.22. He said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. But how do you spiritually grow? Well, I think Peter gives us a formula for that. He wrote in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5-7, through seven, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. Many of Jesus' parables emphasize growing and producing fruit. It was a constant theme in his teaching. 
And it's a calling on each of our lives that when we recognize the talents that we have, it's important to invest them in the kingdom of God. Good stewardship will be greatly rewarded And we don't want to be guilty of the opposite. And that brings me to the final point point that I want you to know. That idle hands are the devil's workshop. Looking at those last few verses of this parable. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I know that you are a hard man. Harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. And his master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I've not sown and gather where I've not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more. And they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness. Where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We are called to wisely use the God-given talents and resources and not to squander them out of fear or complacency. Failing to use his gifts to produce fruit is dangerous. Although one reason why we may neglect growth is fear. The servant who buried his talent justified the lack of growth by saying he was afraid of his master and the prospect of losing his money. Verse 25, so I was afraid and went out and hid your gold. See, here is what belongs to you. That fear led him to do nothing. He knew what his master expected, but he failed to act because of fear. Jesus warned that fear can be an enemy of faith. Do you remember when when Jesus was asleep in the boat And the storm had all the disciples worried that they were going to drown. They woke him up. What did he say to them? He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? And he got up, rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. Another reason that we may fail to produce the fruit God expects is complacency. So here's the question. Are we satisfied with ourselves, with our accomplishments and our achievements? Is that satisfaction to our standards or God's standards? If they're to our standards, then maybe we've dug a hole and put our talents there. Listen to what Solomon wrote. In Proverbs 132, for the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. And then the prophet Zephaniah wrote in chapter 112, at that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish those who are complacent who are like wine left on its dregs, who think the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. Listen to me now. Jesus has given us responsibilities as his followers. And he, who is the master, he's coming back. One day, he promised us. This parable is about wisely using the talents that God has given us. And he's also warning us to not waste them out of fear or complacency. Here's why we need to get out of that hole. I want you to listen. Those 
who are faithful and responsible in using what they have been given will be rewarded. But those who are negligent or fearful will face consequences. Jesus has entrusted us, his servants, to spreading the gospel, forgiving those who have wronged them, loving others, caring for his church, being an example to the world, feeding the hungry and thirsty, caring for the poor, the prisoner, and the sick. Those who are faithful with what they're entrusted with, big and small, will be trusted with more. And Jesus said that they are the ones who will enter into their master's joy and share in the glory of his presence. Those who are not may face the harsh reality of being called a wicked and lazy servant. Worst of all, they may not share in the joy of their master's presence when he comes. Both outcomes should motivate Christ followers to become more intentional with your time and your master's talents. One day the master's going to return. And when he does, he'll want to know what we've done with this precious life we've been given. Were we good stewards of what belongs to him? Did we grow his investment? Or did we bury our time, talent, and opportunities? It's up to us to decide But we better decide quickly. The master is planning his return. And he'll be back at any moment. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. And Matthew, I thank you for putting on my heart to share about talents, about our gifts, about our opportunities. Father, I pray that you would touch each of our hearts today, directing us to get out of that hole if we're there. Father, and to use the things that you have blessed us with for your kingdom, to share your word, to share your message of love, and everything that we do, and everything that we say. And in all these things, I give you praise and thank you. In your son Jesus' name, amen. my heart. And here's my heart, Lord. And here's my heart, Lord. And here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Sing that again. And here's my heart, Lord. And here's my heart, Lord. And here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Cause I am found. I am yours, I am loved, I made pure, I have life, I can breathe, I am healed, I am free, and here's my heart. Speak what is true, cause 
to be here this again this morning. Thank you for the words that have been spoken, the message that has been sung in our hearts today. Go with us this afternoon and in the days to come. We ask all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>